Well, good morning, everyone. Um, we're going to continue our study where we left off yesterday, but before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful uh, for this new day, uh, for all the blessings of yesterday, the way that you work in our lives. We're thankful for the trials that we face and the way that you, you help us through these trials. And we are thankful, Lord, for the things that we struggle with in your word. We just pray, Lord, that as um, we continue to struggle with these passages, that you can help us to put them on a line and to understand them fully. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So yesterday we were, we were basically summing up how we understood Judges chapter 9, how we understood the story of Abimelech. And um, there's only a few little details uh, that we, we can address um, <clears throat> and, and things that we're not fully sure about because they're still future. So when it comes to the death of Abimelech, this message, it comes as a result of a woman dropping a millstone from this strong tower in um, <clears throat> the city of uh, uh, Thebes, or the town of Thebes, which is just not far from Shechem. And um, then he's going to be killed by a sword, ultimately. And so we took that this woman represents a church, um, and it's the piece of a rider. So that uh, that's according to Young's literal translation. That is because this is the top millstone that's dropped on his head. So it's not a piece of a millstone like the little, just a little corner. It's actually the top stone from from a millstone. So there's two stones. The top one has the hole in it. You put the grain, and as it spins, it ends up, uh, the flower comes out at the sides, if anybody's ever used a millstone. Um, and so we relate that millstone to William Miller, right? So that's, that's taking God's word and refining it using Miller's rules, right? Um, now we have this young man, his armor bearer, whether whether there's something there as a symbol that we would use. But it says, then he called hastily unto the young man, his armor bearer, that's verse 54, and said unto him, draw thy sword and slay me, that men say not of me, a woman slew me. And his young man thrust him through and he died. So whether we take the armor, armor bearer as being something in particular, um, to this, to the message of Abimelech, but we know that it's a sword or the word of God that's going to bring about the de demise of this message. And when the men of Israel saw Abimelech was dead, they departed every man unto his place. Thus God rendered the wickedness of Abimelech, which he did unto his father in slaying his 70 brethren, which we understand as being a symbol of time prophecy, because that's the 70 weeks. And all the evil of the men of Shechem did God render upon their heads. And upon them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jeroboam. <clears throat> so if we're going to put these things on a line, especially things that we, we don't know what they mean particularly, um, and we're going to draw up the lines here right away, unless people have some questions before we draw up the lines or things we should look at. <clears throat> Now, when Abimelech went to destroy the city of Shechem, yeah, what symbol can we take from them sowing salt around the city? Okay. Um. Well, usually that's to render something inert, you know, biologically speaking. 
Okay, I, I understand the literal portion, but I'm asking yeah. what the symbolic portion would be. Yeah, so, I mean, this would be, I mean, the way that we understand these men of Shechem, I mean, they're re ultimately rejecting the message completely. So that they're, they're, they're the soil um, is, is not going to bring forth. So that would symbolize... Um, that they cannot receive truth anymore. Well, the first two references that we have when it's speaking of this with salt would be Genesis 14, 3 and Genesis 19, 26. Mm -hmm. And especially 19, 26, because that's, that's giving us the example of Lot's wife. Yeah. So we have um, Lot's wife, Sodom and, and Gomorrah. Right. And um, in Genesis 14, it, which verse? That's going to be something in 14, the... Three. Okay, 14.3. Yeah, the salt sea. So it's just going to refer to the salt sea there. So what we would call the Dead Sea. Right. Now, when we're, when we're looking at this further, as we examine the other verses that have something to do with this, of course, we have Leviticus 2.13 that every oblation of thy meat offering shall be seasoned with salt. Yeah. And it speaks of the salt of the covenant. Mm -hmm. Well, the, yeah, and there's a covenant of salt. So you've got the salt of the covenant in Leviticus 2.13 and the covenant of salt in Numbers 18. So, so this, and, and the idea of salt um, this here. I mean, we know what it is, but we know that uh, Christ refers to it, of course, here, the salt of the earth. So usually it renders in some ways it's connected to the gospel. Um, so the idea of salting the earth to make it inert, um, is different than the idea of we are the salt of the earth. No, no. Yeah, so the word itself means uh, properly to rub to pieces or pulverize and transitively to disappear as dust to salt, whether internally, to season with salt, or externally, to rub with salt. So Abimelech fought against the city all that day, and he took the city and slew the people that were was therein and beat down the city and sowed it with salt. And uh, so in this case, we would still say that the message of Abimelech, even you know, as as it comes into this conflict with the men of Shechem, it makes it impossible to plant seeds that will grow. I mean, that's the idea. I mean, it's more symbolic because I don't know how much salt you would need to make the ground infertile. But I know in some ways it's more symbolic than anything when people sow the land with salt. Yeah, it takes a lot. I know that. So um and how much salt they would have. Salt was, you know, generally considered valuable at certain times in history, in different places, but probably was fairly abundant here. 
but anyway, um, so that's one point that um, we can see the result of this message of Abimelech is uh, counterproductive to, to the gospel. Well, do you think we're ready to try to take Judges chapter 9 and set it upon a line? I think we have a lot of information right now. And we could begin to do this. And you ask if there are any other questions. And that was one of the questions yep. that I had. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, some of these things will come up as we go through this again. Um. So, so I'm going to bless you. Thanks. Okay. So when we have this line here, um, Judges 9. It's going to begin with Abimelech, and I don't really know, uh, you know, exactly because if we're dealing with this as a line, I mean, we're we're putting out these these events, and then we're going to have to decide what they are. But where would we start this line? Because you're going to have the death of Gideon here. Right. Right. Correct. So if we're going to deal with a period of darkness, I mean, the darkness would just be the removal of that judge by death. And how long was Gideon a judge? It'll be at the end of chapter eight there. Forty years. Yeah, so we got 40 years here. Um, so we don't, don't have 40 years of darkness, <clears throat> right? But we definitely have uh, this period of Gideon and it's going to be at the end of 40 years. So I'm not saying that it's 40 years of darkness. But so the death of Gideon, whether that's the time of the end. Um, but normally when you have a reform line, you have darkness. And, and so when we have a reform line, we're trying to understand the relationship of this line to this. So maybe darkness isn't the best way to describe this. Um, but during the time of Gideon, we do have, um, so maybe I'm not going to put the death of Gideon here. I'll put the 40 years of Gideon and, and then I'll put the death of Gideon here. Okay. Now, is there, is there darkness in this period? That, that we're going to have a reform line that's going to address. Because we know that what's going to happen here 
if we're going to have this line of the judges, because Abimelech is not, I mean, it's not a good thing, right? So there is there is a message that's here that's that's going to be come come along. And so however we understand this, we know that at this point here, with the death of Gideon, we're going to have um but we'll put it here, we'll just put it as a waymark. Uh, 70 sons slain. So I'm, I'm doing this a little bit differently. I'm first going to put this line and then try to figure out wh what it is in our history. So we're just putting the line of Gideon. We're not putting the events in our history yet. Okay. So the 70 sons are slain. Is that... I mean, we would have to put then the hiring of how would we characterize these people that are hired? These ne'er do wells. What's the word it says in vain? Vain hiring of vain men. Right. Uh, with seventy shekels. Of silver. Now, <clears throat> so we're going to have the hiring of this vain man with 70 shekels of silver. Now, we're probably still missing out lots of things here because we're going to have a covenant. So, okay. So what are the order of events? Gideon dies. Let's, let's do this differently. So what's the next event? We'll just put these events like this. So what's the next thing? The first thing of chapter nine, really. So Bimelech is going to go to Shechem. Going to his mother's brethren. Okay. Uh, appeal. So he's going to appeal to that's bad. Appeal to uh, his mother's house. Okay. Is that is that how what we would do? Is that what we're going to do next? And Okay, so Judges 8.33, Angela says, darkness heightens, there's this whoring after Balaam. So maybe we would even put the death of Gideon and we'd put something in between here, but we'll sort this out. So, so that's going to happen. Then there is the hiring of the vain men. Uh, the vain and light men. Yeah, vain and light. What do you mean by light? Um, light and is not a lot of weight. Oh. That, that means they're slimmer. They're uh, superficial. Without wisdom. Yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah. And now this, of course, in this, peel, this period, I mean, there's going to be the 70 shekels. However we want to put these, I don't know. I haven't really thought about how to draw this all out. Okay. So you're going to have the hiring of the vein of like men, and then you have the death of the 70 sons on one stone. So there's a lot of information in here, how, how we would take this, whether we take a lot of this as one way mark, and maybe we should, instead of trying to spread this out. Um, Cause, cause maybe what we 
could do if we did this we put darkness in here um we could take all of this dealing with the the death of the 70 sons this whole story of abimelech and of killing the 70 sons and put this as a single way mark so if we did this here we'd put the 70 sons the 70 shekels now i assume also the 70 vain men but you know we can't necessarily conclude that it just it seems to me that there's 70 there's one shekel of silver for each person they're going to be assassinated so this isn't a battle um this and and i don't know how much how many people you could buy with 70 shekels whether you could each person would take a shekel since they're um vain and light men i mean they might be happy to do it for nothing but at least they want to get paid i don't know so <clears throat> does it really tell us that there are 70 vain and light men but they're going to kill the 70 sons okay so what would be next then so we're, we're taking that whole story this period of darkness, this is after the death of Gideon. And then you're going to have these two, two symbols of 70 as a way mark. So what would be next? Now, in here, we also have a covenant that's made in this whole thing, right? Would we agree with that? And so we have a number of symbols here. So these 70 shekels are from uh, the temple of Baal, Bareth, right? Lord of the covenant. <clears throat> so what's next? If we agree with that. Do we put these all together on one way mark or will we divide them? <clears throat> I think we're going to have to leave them on one way mark for the moment. Okay. Now, here we have this covenant. We have the 70 pieces that are given to Abimelech from the treasure that was part of Baal Bereth. Yeah. Now, he hires the set of unprincipled men that were ready for any crime. Yeah. So it didn't matter what they were, what they were asked to do, they were going to do it. Right. And that's why I'm saying, you know, whether they were 70 men or whatever i mean you, you can't couldn't i don't think 70 pieces of silver would generally hire you know one person would want one piece of silver i don't know um, well, I mean, let's okay. l let's if we looked at this why why was the price of christ tied to 30 pieces of silver well price of a slave right so what we're seeing here is that the 70 that are slain, even if, if it was one piece of silver for each person slain, they're saying that those 70 are worth less than a slave. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're just worth a piece of silver each. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, to me, the, the number must be more symbolic than practical, even at that time. Right. right. 
Now, we know that um, Abimelech is made king. Right. So he's going to be made king. And then after he's made king, you're going to have the, the parable of the trees. Right. Right. So this is Jotham. And of course, he's the 70th week. Right. <clears throat> and so this 70th week is a message that points to April 5th, 2030. So this is not the date that it is, but on this line. But it's this message, April 5th. 2030. Right. So that's the first day of the first month. And so this message of Jotham, the parable of the trees, would be the message that basically says this message here is a false message and is going to lead in a certain direction. Right. So, I mean, I, I'm putting some of our stuff here, but not putting it online time wise in our history just showing what it it represents so this this covenant here um is is um this agreement but this is also in a sense is this not a formalization of a covenant in some way how would you see that well, they, he makes a covenant with the men of Shechem, right? He kills the, the 70 sons, and then he's made king, right? So in order for him to become king, he has to kill the 70 sons of Gideon. Is that making sense to people? I'm just moving slow this morning, but yeah. I'm having to consider that. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it could be the form, not just the formalization. It could be the empowerment of the message or something. I don't know. I'm just saying here we have something. He makes a covenant. But really, the covenant isn't enacted until he becomes king, however we want, we want to describe it. Well, OK. I mean, we could separate these things out. We could say there's this agreement that's made. Then the slaying of the 70 sons is this formalization. And then Abimelech being made king is the empowerment. OK, so. The arrival would be Abimelech going to the house of his mother's father. Okay, so so if we're going to do it this way, um, we're going to have three way marks here. So this is right. going to be the time of the end. So this is Abimelech. He makes this covenant. Right. Disagreement. Uh, the 70 sons slain, and then Abimelech made king. How's that? Well, I what I was what I was considering in my mind was Abimelech goes to the house of his mother's father. Yeah. He is then given the money as the formalization okay okay and then you want the 70 sons slain to be the empowerment right that's that's the, what i was considering okay that might that might be be better i know we're we're just trying to work this out we want to we want to take these events and divide them in a way that makes sense on a line now all, all i'm trying to do is present an alternative well, well, but I think it's a good alternative. So Abimelech king 
that's going to be um well, that's, that's the empowerment be, no no what we had is we had abimelech makes this agreement then we're going to have the 70 shekels and then we're going to have the 70 sons okay right so this is the formalization of this agreement or covenant or uh, no, arrival pardon the me. arrival you got the first angel arrives, you got the first angel formalized, and you have the first angel empowered. That's what I'm trying to do. Right. So the sun's killed. That's the empowerment. This and the 70 shekels from the temple of Baal, Bareth, Lord of the Covenant. And there is this covenant or agreement that he makes with the men of Shechem. So this is with the men of Shechem. This is the temple of Baal Bareth, and then this is the sons killed. So then we would have to have him becoming king, the second angel arriving. Whoops, I've got to put this down here. Right? So we could do it this way. Right. I mean, we right. could do it another way. We could make it that Abimelech becoming king is a formalization of this message. If we do it this way, I mean, it's going to affect how we draw the rest of this line. So then we're going to have a message of Jotham, right? Correct. Now, so the way that I was looking at it is I was going to have the message of the parable of the trees as being uh, the second angel arriving. But remember, this reform line here is a reform line about Abimelech. So what is the message of Jotham in the context of a reform line? I mean, if it was the second angel arriving, it would be a message about Abimelech's reform line. Like, it would be part of his reform line. Remember, and this is this is a reform line in a negative sense. So, you know, we might even say that Gideon is, is the darkness in compared to Abimelech, right? So there's lots of different ways we could look at it. Because Abimelech is opposed to Gideon. Right, Gideon is the true message. So this is a counter message that's occurring within our movement, right? Right. Okay. So, so the message of, of Jotham is is more an extension of, of the line of Gideon. So here we're just dealing with the line of Abimelech. And if we remember how we dealt with six, seven, and eight. When, when we start to put these on a line, this is, is a counter message that occurs within our movement. But the message of Jotham brings us back to the message of Gideon, right? And, and, and maybe what we could, we could do here is we could put this period of darkness, as far as Abimelech is concerned, is the 70 sons, right? Yeah. So you can see how when you have light, you know, this really is, is a reverse. This should be really light, you know, from, from the pr pr perspective of truth. And this is an increase of darkness if we wanted to look at it that way, right? And that's a better way of seeing it. Yeah, so maybe we should do it that way. So this is light. And so... So when we mark the death of Gideon, we, we put that as July 18th or connected with that July 18th because it's the July 18th message. So this is light that's coming, but we have this increase of darkness. So you have the increase of darkness, right? That's what's going to be happening here. Okay, so we have this increase of darkness. We have this covenant that's made, this this killing of these sons, and we we could then this might help. This will help us a lot in putting this into our history, how we're laying this out. 
So Abimelech becoming king, um, this is going to ultimately lead to, um, we're going to need some way marks here, right? So we're going to have the second angel formalized, the second angel empowered, and we're going to have the third angel arrive, right? That's what we'd normally have in a reform line. Right. So if we're going to look at these events, where would we take these events that follow Abimelech being king? Now, we're going to ignore, in a sense, uh, the message of Jotham, because it is going to be a prophecy um, that's going to result in the in the death, ultimately, of Abimelech. Right? So one thing we can do is we're going to say, uh, the woman with the millstone, at least this is what I'm thinking, is the arrival of the third angel's message. So what would we put here as the formalization and empowerment? Because remember, this is Abimelech's reform line. Now, and we're not going to show really the method message of Jotham yet, because it's going to be something that leads to these other events. But um, so, so remember, this this is a this is an increase of darkness. Right. Okay. So, so would, think about that. Yeah. Would this be the Shechemites on, on this with the second angel? Would this be the Shechemites turning against Abimelech? Yes. Right. Because this this Abimelech causes him becoming king causes this increase of darkness, doesn't it? Correct. With the second angel's message. Right. So in this. As he's trying to seek, he's exalting himself, right? Against this message that's symbolized by the 70 sons or the 70 weeks. And, and now he's going to take this first step. But because this is a reform line of darkness, um, him becoming king is, is a negative thing, right? Correct. Personally even though he may think it's a good thing. So we got the second arriving. Yeah. Any, any thoughts on this? Anyone else? Wouldn't uh, he be the empowerment of the darkness and be becoming king? He's, he's a what? I so said, wouldn't, wouldn't Abimelech become, uh, being king become the empowerment of darkness? Okay. Well, yeah, I understand. And that's originally what I was going to have it be was the empowerment of the first angel. Right. That's how yeah, I was. Yeah. But Dwight changed my mind. OK. Now, but but that could be right. Um, OK, so let's let's look at it that way then. Okay. OK, so I know that we're moving things around. What's I of D again? Uh, increase of darkness, right? Okay. So you got uh, this increase of darkness happening here, right? So Abimelech makes this covenant. Now, if we were going to put Abimelech king, as the empowerment of this darkness, then this second angel arriving would be a message that's actually going to deal with his demise. Would that make sense? So if we were going to do this, this would go here. So we're going back to originally how I was looking at it. So then we would put here, the 70 uh, uh, shekels and the 70 sons killed, right? Mm 
right. do we like this better? Because then when we get the second angel's message arriving, um, this would be what message? Because we have another message. And I think that's part of what we have to think about is that this is a specific message. And then what message is introduced next? What happens next? So here's how I was thinking of it at first, is that this second angel message is arriving. So with the way that, that Dwight had suggested, I was going to deal with it differently. But I think that this is better. Because we have, um, we have what, what happens here? If, if we're going to put this as Jotham, so we're just going to say that. Um, because this is almost a different reform line. But there is a prophecies introduced that's going to deal with Abimelech's demise. Well, it deals with Abimelech's demise and the demise of, of those of Shechem. Right. So, right. so, so in, in a way of looking at it, it's wiping out the entire house that is connected with Abimelech. Right. Now, the first way that I was thinking, of, so the second angels, in, in Millerite history, the second angel's message is the message of snow, right? That is, you know, I could put Jotham like this. Right? Because that would parallel snow. Right? Just being April 19th. And so, that's I, I I would say that that's more logical. Okay, so this is how I'm, I was conceiving it at, at first, having built them as this message, which parallels, of course, um, this movement, right? But in this in this line of darkness, right? So so his message is not a message of darkness, except that it's predicting this what's going to happen, which is, this is all a line of darkness. Jotham is not darkness. He's actually light. So that's, you know, he's connected to the 70 suns. But he's going to give this prediction. Right? So the message of Jotham is about a prediction that's going to occur. So in some ways, that's how I was thinking of it. It's this, it's this, but here it's sort of like a counter message to what's happening. But it is still adding to the message. It's showing what's going to happen. So if that's the case. Um, so here I'm not making him the arrival of the second angel. But he's a prophecy about the second angel's message. So what would we put here? as the second angel arriving. Because there's a lot of events here and, and how we sort of address those. Okay, so, so we know that there's going to be um, an evil spirit that between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. And then there we're going to have um, the men of Shechem set liars in wait for him on the top of the mountains. So... So we're going to have that situation. And then we're going to have Gaal, the son of Ebed. So how, how, would we, how would we do this? I mean, we've studied all these verses. We should have this somewhat in our mind. You know, you can look at your, you know, you're allowed to look at your Bible. Um, 
So what are the events that we have? We have the men of Shechem with the liars in wait. We have this whole situation with Gaal. And then we're going to have uh, the woman with the millstone. And, and maybe we could still move that to the third angel arriving if we wanted to. Though I have some other ideas, but okay. So what we have is we have we have the men of Shechem turning against Abimelech. So how are we going to look at this on this line? Anybody? Any ideas? Maybe I'll take this out for now. I think it's good that we consider moving this with the one with the millstone to the third okay. angel. Okay. Because that's I mean, the third angel is a warning about a coming judgment. Now, with the second Miller's rules, correct, and the use of Miller's rules exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> now, our situation with the second angel. What we're what we're looking at here is that we have this. Would we call it an anti-reform line because it's it's going into darkness rather than into light? Yeah, yeah. And and here, of course, we have this first angel's message. I mean, we know that messages are testing groups of people. Right. So so you have the first angel, <clears throat> normally like in Millerite history, of Protestants of Millerites. Um so exactly how we we look at this, um, you know, and I'm just going to do this. I'm going to do Shechem and Abimelech. It's probably wrong. But if we if we looked at this, this is about the men of Shechem. They, in a sense, are the ones being tested. That's, but under this next one, Abimelech's being tested. Right. But because it's a line of darkness... I mean, it just ends in his death. Now, the point, the point that we have with this, with the liars in wait, is that they robbed all that came along that way by them. Okay. Why is this a, an important symbol for us to consider? Uh, well, the robbers of thy people, Rome. Exactly. Rome establishes the vision. There you go. Okay, so how does that help us with these lines? So, yeah, we got the robbers of thy people. So Abimelech is not happy because there's the, the robbers of his people. In other words, they are taking from the people what Abimelech saw as being his. Okay. And that's just that's just a simple thought. Because after all this comes up with the the people that are the, the liars in wait robbing the people, then you have Gal, the son of Ebed. Okay. That comes to Shechem. Yeah. So you have Gaal here, right? Right. And this is the robbers. Right. Okay, and so that's just the story of the robbers. Then you have the story of Gaal. So where is this empowerment then? Because this, in a sense, we can see how this is naturally a formalization. Because he's going to come in and, and formalize this rebellion against um, Abimelech. Would the empowerment be the challenge 
that is heard by the bull? Okay. Or would it be something different? Well, well definitely we put the bull there. Right. Would 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 the bull be more under the formalization or would it be under the empowerment? <clears throat> well, this is all about that battle, right? Now in now, this battle, right? This battle. Right. Um now we know that that in some ways Abimelech is going to be at first victorious, right? Correct. But he continues his 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 battle until he's killed in the, that final battle. So so this is the battle of Shechem. Oops, what am I doing? It's not German. Uh, and then this is the battle of um, uh, what's the name of the town? Right next to Shechem. <laughs> <clears throat> trouble with names. Thibes. Oh, yeah. Oops. Thibes. Okay, so you get the Battle of Thibes. <clears throat> now, what we haven't done here is we haven't really specifically tried to see how this fits in our line. I mean, we, we've talked about it as we've gone through it, but now that we put it out in this line this way, does this fit with what we understand about our history? So we look at the death of Gideon as being July 18th, right? So let's draw this line here underneath this. So we just simply put this is July 18th, and this is the July 18th message. Whether, whether we want to do it this exactly this way or not. And from July 18, we're going to be studying, right? Okay. That is, we have this light that's coming from July 18. Even though July 18 has ended, we have the death of, of Gideon. The prediction fails. This is still actually um, lining up with the light. So the covenant of Abimelech is what event in our history? I mean, we can change it, but from the time that July 18 fails, we're going to have a message that arrives, and that message is, is going to be parallel to this message So, so we have some choices. We could put December 6, 2020. We could put December 25th, 2021. And, and that, what would be, why would, if we were going to put December 6, 2020 here, why would we put that there? We know that was a declaration. Yeah, we have the declaration. Is that the arrival of the message of Abimelech? Or is it December 25th, 2021, uh, when Colin presents? I would say uh, it's a declaration. Okay. So so what's your reasons for putting the declaration there? Because that was like the final, final straw, you know. Okay. So as far as the message of Gideon, that would be that that step in the rejection of the message of Gideon. So, and we can look at this all as a rejection of the message of Gideon, right? The message of July 18th. Right. Okay. So let, let's do that. We'll put that there. We put December 6th, 2020. And, and we say that's the arrival of this message. Now, this is opposed to symbolic use of numbers it's opposed to july 18 it's opposed to chronology right yeah it's opposed to chronology but then we're going to have to say that there is a formalization of a message right
So, so this, if this message is this declaration, right? How would this message have been formalized within this movement? Because we're taking this as the first message. That means we have something else as the second message. And if you put this as the first message, and, and remember, what is Abimelech? What is it? What is it symbolizing in this movement? Where does Abimelech come from? This message. And if it's the December 6th, 2020 declaration. It's coming <clears throat> not, not from Gideon's wives, but from his paramour. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this, and this we connect to the message of Parminder, right? Right. Okay. So the message of Parminder then it has to do its work before the second angel arrives. Correct. Now, so I'm just going to do this. I'm going to put this as December 25th, 2021. Okay. So that's just what I'm going to put there for now. So is there stuff that happens from December 6th to December 5th, December 25th, 2021, that, that this declaration creates some kind of environment that from this declaration that's made, things happen in this movement that when we get to here, a people are being tested, right? Because right. this is in the sense of close of probation. And now Colin comes with his message which is this December, this prediction about Trump, right? Um, so we would have to put on the line events here, right? And we do have events, whether I can remember the exact dates of them, um, but I at least can remember the events. So, so what are these events? that are a formalization and empowerment of this message. It's a negative message, right? So remember, this is all uh, going into darkness. So they're going to accept, even though they had re originally rejected Parminder's message, they're really going to accept his message as it relates to July 18, they're gonna still use the same arguments. They still have all this criticism, right? And we can see here that this is... Um, Haven't they gone as far as rejection nine, rejected 9-11? They have they gone that far yet? Okay, so, well, it's going to lead to that, but you know, we're looking at what's happening in the movement. So with this December 6, yeah. 2020 declaration, if this goes here, I mean, we do have events that are going to, whether this is where we mark this arrival of this message, or we even mark it as something before this, I mean, the declaration could be more a formalization. So let's do it this way. I'm going to put the declaration here. Okay, so this is December 20, December 6, 2020. So what would I put this as? Because this is just the formalization of this. Where does this, this message arrive? Where does, where does FFA then give this arrival of this message? 
I believe it would have been, and I'd have to look back to give you dates, but uh, it would have been in October right. of 2020. Right. In October, they have this committee. I don't know what you would call it. No, they have uh, they have a meeting to form the committee. Right. Okay. So they first have a meeting to conform. The, well, I would still put that as all the same thing. But the idea is that they're going to have this message that we're going to examine July 18th, right? But they weren't choosing to examine just July 18th. No, but but the point is they set up a committee basically to tear down this message. Correct. Right. Um, and it's personal. I mean, we know that. A lot of it just has to do with personal feelings. It's nothing to do with whether this is truth or not because they're not actually examining whether something's true, right? Correct. So this, this is an attack against the July 18th message. So whatever date we give to this, this is gonna be this attack against this message. And now we put it there as December, uh, uh, you know, December 6th is this formalization. Um, because they basically have formalized their attack. I mean, we could say it that way. We could even we could even move this over further. We could say the declaration is the empowerment, right? You, you see what I'm saying? It just depends how we define what this message is. Right. Okay. I'm looking back to see if I can't give you a better date. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, declaration works as a formalization. But then we would have to see what the empowerment of this is. And of course, that may not be a specific date. That could just be I mean, it could be something like the selling of the of FFA. But, you know, in some ways you could even put this declaration over here where Abimelech is made king. Because in a sense, that's what they have done in their attack against the message. Now, there are some things we haven't really considered here. One that we need to consider is that we put 9-11 here and 9-11 here, by the way. Right. So uh, I know people don't know what I'm thinking particularly, probably. But... <clears throat> Now, one of the things that we, we've done with this is we've attached some of these dates to specific studies, right? So we know um, this here is a study, right, that Colin presents. And, and we know that at that time that we're going to also have this message here on December 26th, which is the, the understanding of the lines. December 26th. All right? So we're going to we're going to start the study that we're presently on. And and this is the message of Jotham. And and one of the things you see about uh, the message of snow is that it has um, because we're going to say Jotham is the message of snow parallels it and that there is also that this message can that actually begins earlier and one of the things we had done is we had we had taken um the december 26th uh, study which is 
But there was another study that began earlier and that study began when? So that's gonna be the, the examining the foundation study. So when does that study begin? When we examine the foundation. I'm not recalling the date. Okay. I can't remember the date either. Okay, so you're working on that. Anybody else with other ideas about this? Where would we place um, anybody who thinks that we should place the declaration as the empowerment, that we move it over uh, to the empowerment? I don't, I don't see that being moved to the empowerment. I understand it being at the formalization, but that's just my opinion. Okay. Yeah. So it's going to be March, March seventh, twenty twenty one, that we're going to have. Uh, so, so I'm saying that the message of Jotham. Um, so when we go to March. Uh, 7th, 2021. Um, so I'm going to put this here underneath here. So March 7th, 2021. There's 187 studies on the foundation. Okay. And then we're gonna we're gonna have this uh, these other studies happen. So I'm not putting this particularly uh, above, you know, at, at that way mark that's above it. I'm just saying that there this is part of the message of Jotham. That is, it's going to begin just like Snow's message. So the reason why I put the two 911s here, right? This is August 11th, 1840, and this is April 19th. So as far as Snow's message is concerned, it begins after the empowerment of the first angel, but before the arrival of the second. And so I'm saying that the message of Jotham, which would include this, is, is going to begin after the empowerment of uh, the first angel's message in this line. So March 7th, 2021. So that means we would have to have something here. If we're putting the declaration here, we would have to have an event here that's going to be before March 7th, 2021, and that it would have to parallel 9-11. Now, this could just simply be the fall of FFA, right? Right. Whatever date we want to give to that. Now, some people might say, well, this declaration is really the fall of FFA. But if we put the selling of the School of the Prophets, when did that occur? Oh, well, sometime in 2021. I don't remember exactly when. Well, it, it was before March 7th. I know that. I mean, we could probably find that by, um, you know, looking in exam um, the the unity, the call to unity um, WhatsApp group. If you did a search on it, but but I'm pretty sure it happens before March seventh. I believe that it was either in January or February, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And we know that this, uh, this message of Jotham, it's going to lead us to a way marks over here. Now, when we get 
So when we look at these way marks now, um, you know, I generally put um, Adilio's presentation here, which the date, what was the date of Adilio's presentation? If anybody remembers. I know people are writing things in the chat, which I can't see. I think it was uh, February 12th. Okay, yeah, that's what I was thinking, February 12th. But I just wasn't sure. So this is going to be 2021. So I'm going to lay that, that as the formalization of the message. Now, why would I chose Adilio's presentations as the formalization of Colin's message on Trump? Okay, but how can you have February 12th coming after December 25th, 2021? Oh, 2022, pardon me. <laughs> yeah, okay, thanks. There we go, 2022. So why would I call that the formalization of Colin's message? What, what does Adilio add to his message that would make it a formalization? Because he's addressing Colin's message. And then we have to think of what an empowerment is. Well, why would why would his be the formalization and not the empowerment? Okay. And well, and we haven't decided here what this is. I mean the the okay, but the because I put the empowerment as November eighth, twenty twenty two. But all right. And I put this as January 11th, 2023. That's that's how I would do it, right? I'm not saying I'm right. Okay. But as, as far as, I mean, the, the the bits that came from Odilio's message, I mean, it gave some specific support to Colin's message. I'm just trying to recall what all of them were. Okay, so one of the things that he does is he says that, there's going to be a close of probation for those who don't make a decided stand that college message, college oh. Collins message is correct. So he tries to show that this is a, a close of probation that's happening. Okay. Right. Whether how much he really means that, I don't know, but he looks at this close of probation. He talks about that, which, which Colin doesn't. Colin introduces a message, which in his view is not really a prediction. It's just a study, something we need to study and look at that was given to him to look at. But of course, we don't look at it, right? Like this movement doesn't really examine it. They just accept it. And, and they don't want to look at it, right? So then we begin this, uh, the understanding of the lines, which... I mean, in this here, we also have, because this is the message of Jotham at the bottom. Um, this is a message that's going to, uh, now it's going to point to, and this is what I'm going to do, is I'm going to put down here, April 5th, 2030. That is, I see these two as parallels. Because remember, from January 11th, 2023 to April 5th, 2030, is 2,640 2, days, right? Right. And let's hang on here. How did that happen? No. Yeah. 
Let's get to see that people can read this. Okay. So this is what I'm suggesting. And, and that this, this is a parallel. That is, if we look at this as the message of Jotham, the message of Jotham is showing that the message of, of Abimelech is going to fall. And we have this extended time. We made this application for the extension of time. And, and it's taxes, because uh, remember, from, and and maybe we could even, instead of putting November 8th, we could put November 24th, I don't know, but that's more having to do with Jotham's message. So over here, we're going to have November 24th, 2022. Remember, this is going to be 2,688 days, which is 16 times... Uh, 168. But this was an application for the extension of time for paying of taxes. Now, what are taxes? If we think from a biblical perspective. The way I've always looked at taxes is that's a fine for doing well. But <laughs> yeah, I'm talking from a biblical perspective. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> yeah. We also understand your point of view. Yeah. But but this is the control of the government or the state. Right, exactly. And and when it came to paying taxes, you know, Christ showed the coin. You know, whose image and superscription is this? Well, it's Caesar's, right? It's also about Rome. Would we agree with that? Yes. So does it symbolize the Sunday law? You can say that. Right. So when we know that this message of, of Collins is about the coming Sunday law that's going to be occurring here, Right. Not exactly on that date, but he believes that the Republicans are going to run the table as far as the election is concerned. They're going to impeach Biden and Harris. They're going to put Trump as uh, the, the leader of the House, and then he's going to be the next in line to be president. Then he would become president. And um, that's the prediction, right? But we have this application of extension of time that's going to happen. Um, how many days after November 8th? Sixteen days, right? What, now, why was it 16 days? Or is it six days? What is it? 16 plus 8 is 24, what? right? Okay, but you've got... You, I, I'm trying to follow that. November 8th to November 24th. Okay, so that's... You've got 15 or 16 days there. Yeah, we would, we would count 16 days. Right? And remember, this number here is 16 times 168. 168 is a symbol of the week because there's 168 hours in a week. So this is going to point to here, April 5th, 2030. So these 16 days here to me become a symbol. It's also the 16 days in cleansing the holy, the most holy place in the holy place. Right? Okay. And then there's an invitation made to northern Israel. So I was asking Iran about this when I first came on this morning. About the invitation. Is, is this, are we making an invitation right now to the movement with this November 24th date? 
that are we making an application for the extension of time? So instead of having the Passover in the first month, we're going to have the Passover in the second month. Do people understand what I'm talking about? I'm tracking with, with, with what you're asking. Yeah. Because in the past, we made an invitation. We made an invitation back here on December 25th, 2021, because, you know, I actually wrote Colin and said, you know, we would like to be able to have a, a study where this whole movement comes again at the end of, end of the 777 days on who's, who's ever Zoom you want to use um, so that we can study together, right? Agreed. But they, they rejected that proposal. Right? So not everybody necessarily knows that or remembers that. But they rejected that proposal. They said, no, we don't want to have, we don't want to be doing meetings with you because people won't come. We don't want to have the Zoom mixed together. So, so this is the problem that we have, right? So, so I was looking at this as an invitation that, that's rejected. But in a sense, is this not all a part of the same invitation? In a sense, yes. Yeah. So, so we're going to, and so we're having this second Passover because in 16 days, the two, eight period, two periods of eight days, uh, we have the priest and the Levites. Now that's something future, but we're just using it here within this movement internally, right? Because that, that does point to the invitation to the, to, uh, that goes in the proclamation of the loud cry. Right. Or even even the midnight cry as, as far as we look at the Protestants. OK, so hopefully you can see what I'm trying to say here about this line. That this application for the extension of time so that we don't have to pay taxes yet, we're going to put off paying taxes. We need more time. We still have to pay the taxes. The Sunday law is still going to come. But we have this period of time to April 5th, 2030. <clears throat> so when you look at that, I mean, in my mind, I drew it out. So I think it's reasonable. But do people think it's reasonable? At this point, it seems reasonable. Okay. And so, so we're we're in a sense making an invitation still, and that's going to end on January eleventh, twenty twenty three. As far as those that have accepted the message of Abimelech. Now, remember, Colin didn't put that date there, even though he should have. That is, his line shows that date. Because he can't have the 65 days at the beginning of a chronological chiasm and ignore to put the and, and avoid putting them at the end, right? I would agree. Right. So, so when we look at, at Colin's line again, you know, this is a bit more involved because this one has a uh, Trump winning the election, the 1533 days to Biden's in inauguration and so forth. But this this part here on the right, this is basically Colin's prediction. Right. He's going to start with the November 3rd election in 2020, the 65 days to the siege of Washington. And so he's going to take this and. He's then going to connect this period of time here to the midterm election on November 8th. But he's only going to symbolically use the 46th president, uh, the change from the 46th president to the 19th Republican president, right? The 46th and the 19th. So really here, he's marking December 24th, uh, though he marks December 25th for some reason. He does mark that date in 2022. Um, but for different reasons. 
But this would have to be the period in which Trump then, or something happens that leads to Trump being president. So, so Colin still has this period of time in which he could argue that, you know, just because his prediction regarding uh, the Republicans uh, running the table on the election didn't occur, that th events are still going to unfold uh, that is going to put Trump as president. He's saying that this is progressive, right? But when we get to January 11th, 2023, to the end of that date, which is going to mark the end of these 65 days, this is an ordinal count, so it's the end of January 11th, 2023. His prediction really has come to an end. Right? So, and, and we do have these 718 days from, from the siege of Washington to December 24th, 2022. And we have the 781 days from the November 3rd election in 2020 that also go to this December 24th date. So if we're going to look on our line, the next date that's coming up is December 24th, right? We're not predicting anything particularly externally though, because this is really about internal. Is this not, is this line not really about what's happening in this movement? Even though there are some external events that witness to it, this line isn't about what's happening in the world. This line's about what's happening to us. So what I want people to do is I want people to go over these charts. I mean, you have them on the video. You can look at the video again and think about them before we come together tomorrow morning. Okay, because our time is up. And when we can think about you know, that the lines that we drew out this morning, whether those are reasonable or not. And so anybody watching this video who has comments, please comment on, on YouTube if you can. So that we can we can discuss this further. Does that seem seem like a good idea? I think that's what we're gonna need to do. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for the time that we have had to study together here this morning and for the things that you have shown us as we've put uh, the line of Abimelech on our board and how it relates to us. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you can help us to correct any errors in our understanding and um, help us to continue to study and follow you. Give us strength and power in our lives. Forgive us for our sins and help us to cling to you at all times. Watch over each person with your angels. And if it is your will, bring us together again to study your word. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.